السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Dear viewers everywhere, welcome to a new edition of your program Ask Uda. I'd like to remind you of our phone numbers and contact informations in the beginning. As usual, the phone numbers beginning with air code are 0020238552482449. or The email addresses are ask at huda.tv and alternatively gardens at huda.tv. My Facebook page is the uh, Muhammad Salah official. A couple of questions while we're waiting for your valuable calls, phone uh, calls, questions and concerns. Uh, Brother Ahmed Hassan says, in the study of hadith, many students begin with the 40th hadith or the 40 Nawawi hadith, then Riyadh al-Salihin, then the six books. Isn't this an innovation? No, it is not an innovation. An innovation as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that kullu bid'atin dalala wa kullu dalalatin finnar. An innovation is prescribing a new practice in the religion which the Prophet sallallahu did not do, did not approve, nor any of his companions. Like for instance, making a certain number of adhkar or practices or acts of worship at a certain time. Prescribing that without a reference, without a background, it will, con will be considered an innovation. But for instance, the teacher, the tutor, the sheikh decided to put together a syllabus for the students. To begin with the 40 hadith, the 40 hadith have been compiled by many scholars of various hadith covering a broad spectrum of aqidah, of fiqh, of, uh, of tendering the hearts, a hadith, and so on. That's perfectly fine because for beginners it is easier to work on 40 hadith, no problem. Then as they grow older or they manage the study of hadith, they can uh, enlarge uh, their area of studies to study Riyadhus Salihin or the six books of uh, a hadith of the Sahih, beginning with Sahih Imam Bukhari and so on. There is no problem with that. So that would not be categorized as an innovation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Fatima from Gambia. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Ask Uda. Alaikum assalam. Could you do me a favor and raise your volume just a little bit, Sister Fatima, please? Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, could you raise your voice, please? Sister Fatima, could you hear me? Can you, can you say I, I'm sorry, I won't be able to take your question. I, I find it very difficult to understand what you're saying. In addition to the volume is very low. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, please try again, Sister Fatima. Okay. Um, Salam Hassan says, what are the rukns of the prayer? If I miss it, what should I do? The word rukn refers to a pillar. And as we mentioned before, that the prayer consists of pillars, mandatory acts, and sunan or traditions. With regards to the pillars, if you miss any of them, whether out of forgetfulness or deliberately, the prayer will be invalid, such as standing in every rak'ah, every unit in the third prayer while reciting Surah Al-Fatiha is a pillar that if you're capable to stand. Reciting Surah Al-Fatiha in each rak'ah, in each unit of the prayer, whether it's a fard or a nafli prayer, is a rukn, a pillar. Takbiratul Ihram, the beginning takbir, is a pillar. And talking about what happens if you miss any of them, the, the prayer will be invalid. For instance, what many people do, uh, out of ignorance of course, whenever they come late and they join the Imam, while the Imam is in ruku'ah, 
most people would rush to enter the prayer by saying Allahu Akbar and they go for ruku'ah. So we need to ask them this question. Saying Allahu Akbar, was it for the beginning takbir or to enter the prayer or to make takbir to move from the standing position to uh, the ruku' or the bowing down position? If the person fails to, uh, to answer this question, or if he says this is for ruku', then the whole prayer is invalid because he did not begin with the first pillar, which is making takbir or takbirat al-ihram. So what would you do? We'll explain after this call, inshallah. Brother Arshad from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, Arshad. Wa alaikum assalam, How are you, brother? Yes, uh, I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Uh, I have one question as follows. Now, If a Muslim lady doesn't have a driving license and she does not have any other lady to accompany her, can she travel alone in a private car with a driver uh, for learning Tajweed and Akiza classes uh, wearing complete hijab? طيب بارك الله فيك. Thank you. 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 Thank I am awake and that I can pray well at night and read Quran. Is this allowed in Islam or is it considered intoxicant? Number two, my second question is uh, during Bajal, where I come from especially, normally people they come and then you know, they, they, it's like they don't leave and it's lunchtime. So normally um, uh, the family of, of the deceased what they do is they order for food and then they eat and after eating now they go. Now, is this allowed? And also the family members normally they stay together for like uh, three days or even seven, even more. Uh, like sisters, brothers, aunties, normally they gather in one place. Is this allowed in Islam? And my third question is, um, a debt, uh, if you, uh, when you give money to someone, like a debt, and it's a small amount, and if someone you know, is it really necessary to have, uh, or is it haram to, uh, if you don't have uh, witnesses? Yeah, right. Shukran. I'm sorry, Sister uh, Mariam, I didn't get your third question. What if you give some money to who? Yeah, um, if I give like uh, money, uh, like a debt to my, to anyone, like to a neighbor or to someone I know, a friend. And it's a small amount of debt. Now, um, do you have to write it down? If I didn't have witness. Okay, I got your question Excuse me? now. Okay. Thank you, sister. Okay, salam alaikum. Sister Ummu Bilal from the KSA. Walaikum salam. Uh, I have two questions. Yeah. Yes, uh, the first one, uh, I was a convert to Islam, but wasn't able to practice it for many years. But Alhamdulillah, now I gain knowledge and study. So my question is, what will happen to the sin I have committed those times? Okay, Umm Bilal, mm -hmm. I would like to ask you a question. You said that you wanted to convert to Islam, so currently you're not Muslim? Yes. Okay, and you want to convert to Islam? Yes. No, and I already converted because I was married to a Muslim man. Okay. But because I was working before, so I was not able to practice. I was not, uh, wasn't a practicing Muslim, actually. But now uh, uh, I was not working anymore, so I was able to study. And alhamdulillah, I have now four kids and was able to read Quran also and teach them. Excellent. So I'm just concerned of my, the past sin that I have committed during those times. Okay. How long yeah. you been a Muslim, Sister Omo Uh I was converted since 1999. Okay, wait. Okay. Yeah. Do you have so, any other questions? So the second question, uh, what is the difference between a, you when you promise to Allah that you, cannot, you didn't fulfill and an oath? Okay. 
the ransom for an oath that you fail to fulfill. Yes. Okay. And the, the promise also. What is the difference okay. between them? All right. Thank you. Um, great. So I want to go back to um, Takbiratul Ihram as a pillar, for instance. Somebody who said, Allahu Akbar, and he went for ruku'ah, he either missed Takbiratul Ihram because there is Takbir for the beginning of the prayer, that's a pillar. And there is another Takbir for the movement from standing to ruku'ah to bow down position, and so that's a wajib. So if he failed to do this, the prayer is invalid. And if he failed to do the other one, the prayer is deficient because he failed to fulfill a mandatory part which requires him to say Allahu Akbar but the Imam is a ruku' already and I'm afraid that if I do the first takbir and then the second takbir I may miss the ruku' position so what? Do what is proper in order to offer the prayer properly. The pillar, if you miss any pillar you have to make it up then in addition to that Two prostrations by the end, which we agree they're called sajda taissa. If you don't do that, the whole prayer will be invalid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Akbar from the United Kingdom. Assalamu alaikum Akbar. Assalamu alaikum Shaykh. How are you? How are you, Brother Akbar? Alhamdulillah. I'm, I'm fine. Thank you, Brother. Uh, brother, I've got three questions for you regarding praying. No. Uh, my first question is. Um, because I live in London and the mosque is far away from me. It's about 15 to 20 minutes drive. So I want to know, do I have to pray Jamaat or can I pray at home sometimes? Okay. And my second question is, sometimes I go outside London and when it comes to prayer times, I pray in the car. Is that okay or do I have to pray outside? Okay. And uh, third question is, and if I pray by myself at home, do I require to say Dadan or can I just say Takbir and do my, start my prayer? Okay. Yep, that's it, brother. You most welcome. Barakallah Thank feek, Akbar. Thank you. Brother Arshad from Qatar, if a woman doesn't drive and she wants to attend their classes, can she go along with a driver, a private driver in the same vehicle? What you mentioned earlier, you say travel. If it is a travel, no, this is not an excuse. This is not an excuse. Going with a driver, if we're talking about like within the city, like you call him from Qatar, the city of Doha, where it is very safe and it's not like an opaque uh, glasses for the vehicle. You're not sitting in private, you are in public a safe company, fine. It would be better though if you have somebody else along with you in the car so it would not be some sort of privacy. Even though it is not really privacy because you're being seen by others. Um, as far as traveling even without a mahram, alone as we agreed before that the Prophet Sallallahu said it is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah and in the last day to travel alone without a male mahram of her. Um, Sister Maryam from Kenya, with regards to getting together family members, ordering food or having a ta'aleem or some sort of luck, this is all fine. This is among the practices of upholding the ties of kinship, especially if you see this opportunity to make mention of any of the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the ayat, if you invite somebody who can teach this whole gathering something useful in this gathering, that would be a very praiseworthy act and it would be admired. Giving a loan to somebody without writing the loan or having witnesses will be pardoned if it is something insignificant, right? Something very little, but when it comes to a significant amount of money, then Allah the Almighty order that the debt should be recorded in writing and you should have witnesses. And this is stated in the longest ayah in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. Ya ayuha ladhina amanu idha tadayantum bidaynin ila ajalim musamman faktubu. So it requires two things, actually three. Number one, ajalim musamman, determine for how long. 
most of the problems erupt as a result of that somebody says, I gave somebody a loan and uh, he doesn't want to pay. The other person says, we, we didn't agree to a specific time or a schedule for the payment. So whenever I have, no, a daily musamma, a fixed term, I'm going to pay in a few months, in a couple years, whatever, and the payment will be as follows. Uh, then Al-Kitabah to be recorded in writing. Nowadays it could be uh, uh, notary public, it could be certified, uh, fingerprint, signature, and Al-Ishhad to have the witnesses in order to secure your rights. It doesn't mean that you don't trust the person whom you give him the loan, whether it's he or she. Rather it's also that if that person dies or if the debtor himself or herself dies, then the heir's rights will be maintained, whether here or there. Barakallah fiki. Sister Umm Bilal, who reverted to Islam, but since she was preoccupied with work, she was not really practicing Islam. Alhamdulillah, now she is on the safe path, as she says, and she is practicing Islam. Would Allah forgive her her past? Um, Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him, as you know that he's one of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He did not really accept Islam amongst the first generation or the, the early companions. His Islam was delayed a little bit. So when he came to accept Islam, and the Prophet وسلم, stretched out his hand in order to take the Pledge of Allegiance from Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As, said to the Prophet وسلم, after pulling back his hand, he said, not before you promise me. He said, promise you what? He said, you know, I've committed a lot of sins. As many of us would say, in Jahiliyyah, I had a terrible past. I'm not sure whether Allah will forgive me all those sins or not. So promise me that Allah will forgive me my sins. The Prophet وسلم, smiled to him and said, don't you know that Al-Islam yajubbu ma qabla? That Accepting Islam would wipe away all the sins which were committed before that moment. Al-Hajj, likewise, performing Hajj expiates all the sins before Hajj. Performing Hijrah and also repenting unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're sincere in your repentance and you started practicing the deen, then inshallah that will be accepted. Now, there is one thing that we need to discuss. There are certain things which may be pardoned. And there are certain things must be made up. For instance, since you accepted Islam, if you say that you are Muslim, but you did not pay zakah, you have to pay the delayed zakah even if it is years. Similarly, it's fasting. You have to make it up. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abdul Aziz from Ethiopia. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother? Yeah. Jazakum Allah khairan. Wa jazakum. I have a, I have a one question for you, sir, which is similar to the question which has been asked prior to me. Go ahead, please, Brother Abdul uh, I was uh, originally also was uh, from a Muslim family. And then uh, uh, I was not a practicing Muslim. Then, uh, this time in Columbia College, I have been uh, I have been out of my religion. Alhamdulillah, now I am back. Uh, past like uh, three four years, I am I am now uh, back to Islam. Alhamdulillah. 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 Congratulations. Uh, meanwhile, I have been I have been committing so many uh, so many sins. And what will happen to that? How can I uh, make it up? Okay. Sir? I just want to ask you about it. Thank Subhanallah, what a coincidence! Way, I, I'm really, I'm really appreciating, I'm really appreciating what you're doing. Jazakumullah khairan. Wa jazakum. Thank you, brother Abdul Aziz from Ethiopia. Uh, you called, and I just answered this question right now, Sister Umm Bilal's question. But inshallah, Azza Jal, I will shed some more light on this after a few calls. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Zaki, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, Sheikh. How are you, brother? Alhamdulillah, fine, thank you. Uh, today I have one question. This is on behalf of another person. Mm -hmm. um, he was like interested to know if, for example, a person is going for a numrah and he is going to a numrah to perform for himself. 
And after he completes Umrah, can he come back to this Aisha Masjid and uh, perform Umrah on behalf of some other person on the same trip? Okay, is this other person alive or dead? Yes, yes. He, he may be dead. He is dead, I believe. Okay. So after performing the Umrah for the first time for himself, and can he like go back to this uh, place where he, he needs to uh, uh, make a haram and come back again to got perform Umrah for on behalf of another person? I got your question. Barakallahu feek. Okay. Now, talking about repentance, let me share with you the best news ever. Let you be non-Muslim or a Muslim but not practicing Islam or a Muslim who's involved in big sins, big time sins, or a person who's addict to sinning. The greatest ayah in the Quran with regards to giving hopes to the sinners, Allah the Almighty says in Surah Al-Zumar, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم Allah the Almighty is ordering his prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم to convey this message to whom? To the believers, to the righteous servants, to the devout worshippers? No, to the big time sinners. Those who've committed all kind of sins, all sort of disobedience, they are entirely sucked in, in disobedience to the point that Allah said, "Asrafu." They transgressed all the limits. Ala anfusihim. They only hurt themselves. Tell them what? What is the message? Despair not of Allah's mercy. Do not lose hope. Why? Because for Allah, He forgives all sins. Adultery, drinking, gambling, usury, bribery. I'm talking about major sins. Yes, Allah will forgive all of that, provided you repent. Provided you're sincere in your intention to repent. So what you need to do is take the initiative. Allah the Almighty says, Brother Abdul Aziz, if my servant come to me with an earth full of sins. I don't think that you've committed sins enough to fill the whole earth, but let's say so. Allah the Almighty says, as long as he comes to me, not sitting with me any partners in worship and obviously repenting unto him, I shall meet him with an earth full of forgiveness. So Alhamdulillah, if you're sincere in your intention, Allah would accept your repentance, forgive you your sins. Remember, if you are lacking behind in certain worship, that which is mandatory, you are required to make them up. He did not pay zakah for the past years, and you are wealthy. Now you have to estimate how much zakah you have to pay for the past years and pay it. How many days of Ramadan you missed, and you make them up. We'll talk about making up the prayer as well. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Um Umar from Jordan. Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead, sister. I'm listening to you live when asked, Kuda. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have one question about the cat. Go ahead, Hello. please. Uh, Sheikh, what is the punishment of the man if he opens feeding the cat because of attacking his bird? Okay. He didn't pay zakat deliberately. You said for what reason? What? You said the punishment for somebody who did not deliberately pay his zakat. I mean to say, the person, he's feeding a cat. Feeding a cat or paying zakat? I mean to say he's killing a cat because of attacking his bird. He has a bird pigeon. It's hard to understand what you're saying. And then he, he, he used to shoot the, the cat 
In order to stop. In order to do what? Now we're talking about a cat, definitely. Not the cat, rather a cat. Okay, we'll see about the cat, inshallah, in a little bit. Barakallah feek. Um, Kafaratu al-yameen. The ransom for making an oath and failing to fulfill your oath. The ayah in Surah Al-Ma'idah is a reference in this regard. لا يؤخذكم الله باللغو في أيمانكم ولكن يؤخذكم بما عقدتم الأيمان فكفارته so the ransom for an oath which you confirm by saying I swear to Allah or you made a vow and you failed to fulfill it something whether to do or not to do in the future فكفارته as follows its ransom is number one إطعام عشرة مساكين من أوسط ما تطعمون أهليكم أو كسوتهم أو تحرير رقبة so feeding ten poor people or clothing them buying them an outfit like شوال قميص a thob pants and shirt an outfit for ten poor people or buying them meals that is the first option أو تحرير رقبة is equivalent to so you still have the choice or freeing a slave neck فمن لم يجد فصيام ثلاثة أيام if you can't afford it financially then fast for three days doesn't have to be consecutive though ذلك كفارة أيمانكم إذا حلفتم واحفظوا أيمانكم that is the ransom for your oath when you make an oath and you say I swear to Allah I shall do this then you don't do it the ransom is this when you say, I swear to Allah, I will never smoke anymore, then you go back to smoke. This is the ransom. When you make a vow, you say, Lillahi alay, I vow to do this or not to do that, then you fail to fulfill your vow likewise. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sister Fatima from France. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I have one question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a family and um, the mother. There's a mother, son, and the wife. Uh, the son is earning in a haram way, and then the mother and the wife have no other source of income. So, are they permitted to eat his food? And the son is sending them for Hajj and Umrah. Are they permitted to go? And then now they are like now in India, it's like very common that without Without bribing, no, not even a small job or a big job can be done without bribing. And in, as you know, in Islam, bribing is haram. So, how how can we Muslims, you know, deal with it? Okay, thank you, Fatima. Your English is great, though, for calling from France. Thank you, Sister Fatima. Everybody, let's take a short break, and we'll be back inshallah in a few minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Ummu Jameel from Nigeria, welcome to the program. Thank you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh. Yeah, I'm praying to Allah to give you good health to continue and give good work you are doing. Thank you, sister. Allah bless you and your family. This is my son, Jameel, to be like you, like you, inshallah. And better, inshallah, hopefully. Inshallah. Then my question is this. I am like asking on this account. Because I have an account which my husband used to put the for for me, and so I take the money for the house, so I spend you know, the time. Uh, oh, sister Omo Jami, your voice just st stop breaking off. I, I couldn't understand the question you said about the cat and the home. Yeah, it's concerning the cat. It's concerning the cat. I'm asking. I say I have an account which my husband put money for my for household and at the same time he give me allowance for monthly allowance sometimes he give me just money and he can put to the account for me mm -hmm. but i take the money and i buy the household again sometimes i spend on children i spend on my own so concerning that kind of money so i know by the end of the year i can't be able to say this is the so amount of money that is in the account 
exactly, which I can say is mine or for the household. So how do I remove the card for this kind of money? Okay, inshallah, I'll give you a comprehensive answer in this regard. Thank you, Sister Umu Jamil from Nigeria. Brother Malik from Oman. Assalamu alaikum, Malik. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum. Assalamu rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brother? Uh, I'm fine, sir. Alhamdulillah. Uh, sir, actually, this is, I have a query regarding uh, zakah. Okay. Go ahead, brother Malik, please. Sir, uh, I bought a piece of land uh, in a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that is for almost around 60,000 real, Saudi real. Mm -hmm. uh, now the land value is appreciating every year. Now this year, if I want to pay zakah for that, which amount I have to pay exactly? Okay. The amount which is appreciating. Malik, Malik, I need to ask you a question. Why do you think that you have to pay zakah on the lot? Sorry, sir? Why do you think that you have to pay zakah on the lot? On the land? Yeah, Actually, why? Actually, sir, I bought it for, uh, no, like it's like a saving uh, I didn't have any near like when I buying, so I just bought it for uh, like kind of saving. Okay, Maybe did you buy it? Want to sell it okay, out. did you buy it as an investment? I mean, to save some money in it. Then, when the market uh, value goes up, you sell it. Or what intention did you buy the land with? Actually, so it's like uh, I don't have any intention. My parents actually they told me to just to buy a land. Or okay, no, you don't have any intention. You don't have yeah. any intention then you're not obliged to pay zakah on the lot. It's only when you buy, like you're investing in buying properties and selling them, then the value, the retail sale value, or the value of the property at the time of paying zakah is a catable. You bought it for 50,000, and a couple years later, now you're saving the property in order to make a profit. You're purpose and your intention when you bought the property is to resell it, is to make some money out of that. So every year, the value of the property, whether it increases or it decreases, is a catapult. It has become 60, you pay zakah on the 60,000. It has become 35, you pay zakah on 35, okay? But first of all, you have to formulate an intention. What is your intention? If you don't have an intention of selling or whatever, then you don't have to pay zakah on that property. Barakallah feek, Brother Malik. Uh, sister Umu Jamil from Nigeria. Um, she has a joint account with her husband for the household, and he gives her an allowance. Let me tell you this. This is concerning partnership. If partners who invested in one company, this is a typical example, and by analogy, you can figure out the answer in your case. And everybody is chipping. And by the end of the year, there is one of two ways to do it. If every partner wants to pay zakah on their own, on their own shares, that's perfectly fine, provided everybody knows how much is his or her share. Then they can dispense the zakah on their own. Or the alternative is to pay zakah on the whole sum of the partnership, okay? The investment, the profit, the cash, the available cash, and that will be for all the partners. In your case, if you have a joint account, you're earning and he's earning, or if it is only his earning, then you pay zakah on the entire account if it exceeds, if it is equivalent to or exceeds the threshold of the zakah, which is, which we call it uh, a nisab, which will make any money zakatable. If you maintain the value of 85 gram of gold for one complete lunar year, or the value of 595 gram of silver for the period of one complete lunar year, then it becomes a catapult. Well, there is another case scenario, which is your own earning, your own position is lesser than this value, and his is lesser than this value, then neither one of you is required to pay zakah. If your position is recognized and his wealth is recognized, you don't have to add them or join them in order to pay zakah. If each one's position, even if you happen to put them in a joint account for a reason or another. What matters is a zakah, zakatul man is on each individual. And that's why some people tend to break down their wealth, like give their sons, their daughters, whatever, 
then it's actually under their control. But breaking down the zakah and breaking down their wealth and position amongst many members of the family, by that they think that they can escape the payment of the zakah. If the money is still yours, then it is all zakatable, even if you give it to your minors, because it's in your position actually. Okay? You have a joint account. Your husband now is giving you allowance. If this allowance you spend on the household, you cover the expenses, then you manage to make some saving out of that. If by the end of the year, the saving is equivalent to or exceeds the value of uh, 85 gram of gold, as you said, or the value of 595 gram of silver, I'm talking about the current price. And that was maintained for a whole year. Some wives, some housewives, whom I like to call them house engineers. MashaAllah. They are very economical. They manage to make savings out of the little bit. So if this saving ends up that MashaAllah they have that much, then it will become zakatable by itself. Now it's in your position. So you have to pay zakat on this. And your husband is paying zakat on the joint account as well if it reaches the nisab or it exceeds it. Barakallahu feek. Brother Akbar from the UK. His first question is that he lives 15 minutes away from London. I mean, talking about 15 minutes driving. Does he have to attend the prayer in congregation every prayer? That's based on the view which says that attending the Father prayer in congregation is a must for men. But 15 minutes drive isn't something easy, especially in the UK. You don't have to, but at least try to maintain this as much as you can. In, in the States, so we used to do this with pleasure, like Maghrib and Isha would drive back and forth, 15 minutes, especially in big states like in Texas and California, no big deal. But in the UK, oh my God, driving there in London is, is, is really headache. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. If it will burden you, then you don't have to do it on a regular basis every single father prayer. But at least try to maintain the Isha prayer, Maghrib prayer, you know. If you go to work in the morning, attend the Fajr prayer in congregation, then go to work. Why? Because being connected to the Islamic Center and the Muslim community is really the most important thing for a Muslim in the West. It is what will make you really living as a Muslim. It's very, very important. Especially if the Imam gives a khatira after the prayer. It will help you to inspire you to increase the level of your Imam. Not to forget that for Friday prayer and the sermon, it's a must. 15 minutes, half hour, you should still attend the prayer in congregation. While driving back and forth, is it permissible to pray in the car after the school? Assalamu alaikum. Sister Aisha from Nigeria. Alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah. Wa alaykum uh, assalam, yeah. Sister Aisha. Go ahead. Yeah, Sheikh. Um, if I have uh, savings for my children, but uh, the children, they are young, and uh, I'm saving, I open the bank account for them, I'm saving money in their name, but um, the money is mine and it has reached an amount that. Um, I can give zakat. I don't know if it's uh, mandatory for me to give zakat on such. Yes, Sister Aisha. Yes, if it reaches an nisab, as I just explained a few minutes ago, then you should pay zakat. Mm -hmm. You said the money is yours. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you yes. transfer the property entirely, whether it's money or otherwise, to your okay. son or daughter, where you would not have an access to it, you give it to him. If each child mm -hmm. saving is zakatable, then you pay zakah. Even if the kids are orphans. Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, you should invest, may Allah be pleased with him, said, you should invest in the orphans' wealth, like in the inheritance which they inherited from their parents, lest the zakah may devour it, which indicates that as long as there is some money saved, even if it belongs to orphans, you should pay zakah on it. Once it fulfills the two conditions, the annual basis, which is a whole year round, a lunar calendar, and it reaches the nisab, which is the threshold which will make the money zakatable. Thank you, Sister Aisha from Nigeria. Um, 
I just want to say, I know that many Muslims are watching us. I would like to show them how much Muslims are very keen to pay. To pay in a charity. Because paying the poor's dues and rights is much more important than saving for our own selves. It is something which will also determine your fate on the hereafter. Um, we have uh, the second question of Brother Akbar praying in the car. No, as long as you're able to stand up, then you should not be sitting while praying the fard. Anywhere in the UK, in Europe, I can simply pull over if you have your janamas and you have a campus. Now, especially if you have uh, the app, the uh, Islamic Finder app on your phone, on your smartphone, you'll be easily able to find out the direction of the Qibla, then pray while standing. It is not permissible to offer the prayer sitting down while able to stand in the fard prayer. You can do that in the naf. The Prophet Sallallahu used to do that and the hadith is collected by Imam Bukhari. If you're praying by yourself, do you have to call adhan and iqama? You don't have to call adhan if the adhan is being called anywhere. Okay, but it is recommended. But you should call iqama even if you're praying by yourself. Uh, Brother Zaki, somebody is performing Umrah. Can he, after performing his own Umrah, perform another Umrah on behalf of somebody who is dead, somebody who passed away, simply by going out of Al-Haram, the sanctuary, whether to the area which is known as at tanim or Masjid Aisha, or any area outside the sanctuary? Yes, you may do that, provided you're offering the Umrah on behalf of somebody who passed away or somebody who is physically incapable of traveling. Um, Sister Fatima from France, thank you for asking this question. Also, you see how Muslims, and, and she's calling from France. Uh, she's very concerned about somebody who's providing for the family. He's not the family father. He's a son, but he's only working and earning family. So he's earning from unlawful sources. She mentioned bribery and so on. Uh, what about the family members? Can his mother still eat from the food which he buys and so on? If they don't have any other source of income, they should consume what is necessary. Utilize from his money what is necessary. If his earning is absolutely haram. If his earning is mixed, they can eat and drink and spend from his wealth again because they don't have any other source of income and all the sin would be on him he's blameworthy and it doesn't mean that we enjoy the free ride and say to him go to hell no and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ad-deenu nasiha we should advise one another if you love your son if you love your daughter if you love your parents if you like your friends if you love people enjoin them to what is good forbid them from what is evil that is the practice which made this ummah superior to other nations this is the practice which makes the believer unique different than others and this is the practice which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made those who would adopt it safe from loss all mankind are in loss except whom? Those who believed and did good righteous deeds and enjoin one another to the truth and enjoin one another to patience. So enjoining what is right, forbidding what is evil is a cornerstone in our faith and in our religion. And guess what? The amount of feedback I receive, my email, on the messages from people whom, alhamdulillah, have benefited a great deal from this program, that bank managers, bankers, people working here or they're quitting their job because they figured out it is haram. And also they shared to us the good news that soon afterward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened for them better and bigger doors for the provision. Why? Because Allah the Almighty said, Inna Allah huwa al-razzaqu dhul quwwati al-mateen. Allah is the ever provider. So seek the provision from the ever provider through lawful means and do not challenge Allah with sins. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. 
وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم and until next time السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen Allah